Bostonian suffragist Margaret Foley visited Shelby on June 29, 1912, as part of a two-month tour of Ohio on behalf of the Ohio Women's Suffrage Association. The notion of women casting a ballot had become more of a possibility with six Western states already granting women the right to vote. In 1894, Ohio women were given school suffrage. They were able to run for school board positions and vote in school board elections. 1912 was the first time suffragists were able to bring their cause directly to Ohio voters. Margaret Foley was a single woman, an Irish Catholic, who hoped to become a singer. After graduating from high school in Boston, Foley began working in a union hat factory to support her aspiration. She went to California for a time, but was forced to give up her singing career. She returned to Boston in 1906 and was employed by the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association as a public speaker. She would become a leading voice for working women as the only suffragist with a working class background. Fresh from a convention in Stockholm, she began to engage in public debates with elected officials and other prominent men. Newspapers were quick to notice that Foley held her ground and passionately argued her viewpoint. A reporter at the end of her Ohio tour remarked about the sunny good nature of Miss Foley, her Irish wit, and her pluck, which enabled her to gather and hold a crowd. Her appearances in Ohio, for the most part, were orchestrated by Harriet Taylor Upman, president of the Ohio Women's Suffrage Association. There were some notable speech makers who came to Shelby in the months before her, but they all spoke indoors at the Opera House. Foley had been trained in the ways of the English suffragettes and preferred to speak at outdoor venues. Foley spoke in several area towns from Ashland, Chicago Junction, now Willard, Tyro, Shiloh, Plymouth, and Mansfield. Her trip to Shelby may not have been intended. Harriet Taylor Upton wrote to Margaret on June 26 that Dr. Lydia DeVille Bishock, president of the newly formed Shelby Equal Franchise Association, arranged for a special car and band for the day in Shelby. Upton wrote to, Sh to Foley, you are a power of yourself and that I have other work for you and that you cannot do this. I am writing to you personally to tell you to get away from Mrs. Shock and stay away, to trust me in this regard and that I will explain when I see you. It is not known whether Foley received the letter in time or chose to ignore it, but Margaret did arrive in Shelby and toured the town in the afternoon by car, stopping several times to give impromptu speeches, then went to Plymouth to address a crowd there. Hundreds of townspeople turned out for her speech in Shelby that evening. The entourage was late coming back from Plymouth and it was 8 p.m., nearly dark, before Foley began her speech. Mayor George Miller intended to introduce her but had gone back to City Hall to wait. He assumed someone from the Equal Franchise Association would fetch him. No one did. The ladies also arranged for lights to be turned on at the bandstand, but, need, but either through misunderstanding or on purpose, the place was dark. Margaret's speeches, as well as other correspondence, are housed at the Schlesinger Library at Harvard. The following speech was likely given throughout Ohio, although extended to an hour or more, and possibly adapted for urban or rural audiences. The movement of the world is away from all the customs and teachings of the early ages, and so the political status of woman cannot be an exception to the rule. In the early days, the family was self-supporting and independent of the rest of the community. They raised all food necessary for the family on their little farm, meats, vegetables, grains, milk eggs, butter, cheese, all the home products. The mother knew that the food was pure, clean, and wholesome. 
and such as she could afford to give her children. It is not so today. All these things are under governmental control. Much of the food is unclean and unwholesome, and yet the mother is obliged to buy that food, taking risk of giving food that may bring sickness and disease to her family. The only way to control food supply is through legislation. It is the same with the water supply which can no longer be cared for by the head of the household. It is now a town, city, or state supply. It may be pure or impure. This question lies with the government, therefore the mother heart, the home element, should be expressed in the government by giving a vote to the women in the home. We are told that politics is too corrupt for women to enter as a voter, but does she not live under a government which is dominant by politics? If it is too corrupt to admit women as a voter, then politics are too corrupt to make and administer the law which influence her life. Laws are enacted requiring individuals to be clean and upright, and yet the source of all this lawmaking, namely the political world itself, is said to be unclean and unwholesome. If our government is built on moral law, it should be clean enough for women to have a voice in it, as there are no better house cleaners than women. We certainly need them in politics. There is no great cry on the part of men because of the contaminating influences which women meets in the business and industrial world. They are not keeping her out of the various vocations of life because of the evils which she might encounter. Are not sweatshop conditions and overworked and underpaid evils far more destructive than the physical, mental, and moral welfare of women than any condition in which suffrage might place her. Through the great economic and political changes of the past century, the working woman of today is entitled to the same rights and privileges according the working man in the political world. These changes have taken her from the home and have brought her into the business and industrial life, where she has become more and more man's equal and competitor, leaving behind those conditions which so long made her dependent on him. This has not been of her own choosing. The invention of machinery by man has taken the work formerly done in the home from the spinning and weaving even down to baking and laundry work, and masses it in great factories and shops. As a result, the homes of today and hundred years ago are very different. Instead of woman taking man's work, it is the reverse. He has appropriated to himself what was long supposed to be hers. When this is not the case, she must at least do it upon man-made plans, as this simply means that in developing this country, men have conscience, taken away from the home, its industrial life, and women find what was formerly a work of love is now done under new conditions and strange environments. It is strange that any thinking being should consider in the general evolution and progress of the world that women alone should stand still. Industrial and economic conditions today are such that however many of the 7 million working women in the United States wanted to stay home, they could not do so because they are compelled to support themselves and others. The wage earning girl or woman today
has little chance beside her brother, except in the trade unions, although she performs the same amount of work. Yet she cannot command the same wages, largely because she is not a recognized citizen. Every year, conditions in the business and industrial world become more trying. Business methods, about which so much is said these days, mean more exacting requirements and greater complexity in all work. Woman is expected to meet all these demands and even to exceed men in matters of detail. This experience in the outside world is educating her. She sees that she is forced to compete with men who have full political right, while she herself is a political non-entity. She often finds that she must protect herself against conditions which are more often political than economical, forcing upon her the conviction that she too is entitled to be a full-fledged voter. She sees that politics, business, and industrial life are interrelated, and that since she is a factor in two, she should be granted the right and privilege of the third. She sees that being a political non-entity, she is at a disadvantage as a breadwinner. Think of the number of wage earners in this country who are without political representation. The working woman needs the ballot because there are economic conditions which can be solved by the ballot only. At present, laws are made without the woman's viewpoint. We know that the ballot carries with it responsibilities. We know that the person who is discriminated against by law is always the poorest paid. Therefore, woman's labor is cheap labor. And unjust discrimination against her as a wage earner will continue until she becomes man's equal politically. The great bodies of organized labor have for many years endangered woman suffrage and have declared that work should be paid for, not according to the sex of the worker, but the merits of the work. But the working man knows that this will not be so long as she is without power in politics. Therefore, political enfranchisement is a matter of vital concern to the working woman. A government of the people, for the people, and by the people is only realized when every individual has equal share in administering such a government. When one, where one class governs Without the consent of all, there is no true democracy. It is this that led our government to give the colored man political enfranchisement. The same conditions which freed the Negro have been freeing women. The modern movement demands direct influence for women upon the legislation, which concerns all people. It recognizes the vote as the only means of securing recognition of their needs. Two things are certain. First, woman suffrage is not a receding wave. It is a mighty incoming tide which is sweeping all before it. Second, no human power and no government can stay its coming. I trust that every man of Ohio will give the women of Ohio a square deal by voting for the Equal Suffrage Amendment on September 3rd. <laughs>